Dr. Derek Lee, my pleasure to welcome Dr. Jean Wadet. Uh, he's a professor of spine surgery and president and chief medical officer of Momentum Health. Dr. Wadet, welcome. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to be on your channel. All right. Now, um, I do like to interview uh, certain businesses and industries on innovation and scoliosis. And today we're going to talk about uh, innovation that you co-founded uh, called the Momentum Health, which is a spine app uh, for uh, scanning scoliosis. Is that correct? That is correct. So um, myself and a uh, actually a son of a colleague started working on a project uh, even before he got into medical school, starting to kick around some ideas. And we came up with an idea that could maybe change the way that we follow and sort of screen scoliosis. Excellent. Can you talk a little bit more about that? You have a present presentation ready, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I'll be glad to uh, maybe share my screen. What we've sort of developed is really this idea of uh, monitoring uh, scoliosis remotely and really looking at the uh, ways to, to not use x-rays. And um, so before I start, I'd like to sort of just uh, sort of obviously uh, state the obvious, uh, seeing that I'm a co-founder and a shareholder, uh, I obviously have a bias. So the objective of the talk are really to highlight the current challenges uh, as a surgeon uh, that treats scoliosis, how we do uh, across Canada, and what are the current challenges that uh, patients and physicians need to sort of overcome to be able to provide an adequate uh, care for our, our patients. Second objective will be to really advocate that uh, we should be looking at early detection and initiation of early bracing for a lot of our patients. And thirdly, obviously, I want to introduce Momentum Health, as a possible solution to improve access to care. Now, uh, maybe for the uh, people that are following us that don't really know what scoliosis is, well, uh, scoliosis, the most common form is really adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. It's a three-dimensional uh, deformity of the spine that results in a curvature of the spine. And a lot of people say, well, it's just the spine is bent to the side, but the reality is that it's so much more. The spine is really rotated. And as the spine, as children are growing, the spine almost buckles on itself. And that buckling leads to this uh, rotation, translation, and oddly enough, this sort of retro slippage. So you lose some of your roundness of your back. Now, for decades, what we've done is to, in order to monitor uh, children that have deformity, we essentially get an x-ray. We get a frontal and lateral x-ray, which is a bit odd because when you think about it, we're using a two-dimensional metrics and trying to measure a three-dimensional deformity. And then over the years, we've found that this uh, x-rays, uh, granted, has provided some help to try to quantify the deformity. And the reason why we need to quantify it is that it actually dictates how we want to treat it. So a cob angle, so if you have scoliosis and, and your physicians talk to you about a cob angle, cob angle is really a measurement on a frontal x-ray, looking at the most tilted vertebra. So those are the, the bones of your spine. And that's, you go from the most tilted to the most tilted and gives you a degree. And so on the, on the screen, you see that you measure the angle between those two. The value of that is that depending on the severity of your curves, you have different type of treatment. So small curves tend not to get worse. So therefore they tend to be observed. The curves that we're really worried about are the curves that are between 20 and 50, especially in a growing child, that these are the ones that if left alone, there's a high percentage of these patients that the curve will continue to progress. progress. And that those are the ones that we tend to want to monitor closely and, if need be, initiate bracing. Now, the, um, once the curves go beyond 50 degrees, well, then we know that these curves will continue to progress for the rest of your life and that these are the ones that we tend to recommend surgery. So depending on when we actually capture the scoliosis, well, depending on where your curve is, then there's different recommendation of treatment. Now, the clinical problem is... is Obviously, you want to make sure that you're not going to be missing any x-rays or any uh, children that have scoliosis. So uh, you would sort of want to follow them and get x-rays. The problem with getting x-rays is obviously that radiation is not uh, generally a good thing for your body. And there's a study in 2020 that actually shows that patients that have a diagnosis of scoliosis run one and a half times higher odds of developing cancer. It's actually, they've also shown, and this is over... Uh, 48,000 patients that they looked at, and that they actually have a one and a half times higher odds of dying from cancer. And the women are actually at higher, 1.2 higher odds of having breast cancer. So obviously there's this sort of dilemma between getting frequent uh, 
follow-ups and frequent x-rays. And then, but you don't want to get those too often so that you don't miss um, a curve progression. So that if you space out your follow-up, then you may be missing initiation of treatment. So here's a case example. Here's a young uh, family that showed up to our clinic, essentially had a positive family history of a child um, at the age of eight. And they said, well, the curve is really small. No worry, we'll see you in six months just to sort of see how things evolve. And lo and behold, in six months, you started developing a small curve, seven three. So we said, well, that's okay. We'll see you again in another six months. And by the time she came back, essentially her curve now had increased to 28 degrees. These are the curves that she falls into that category between 25 and 50 that we initiate brace treatment. Essentially, she follows the treatment for four years. And at the end, she has a residual 30 degree curve. Hence, we feel that we have achieved reasonable outcome. The problem is that if you look at her clinically, I'm not sure that that's really what patients really want. And ideally is that they believe that we could do better. Now, one of the challenges that we have in Canada is obviously just the overall incidence of scoliosis. When we think about uh, the incidence, about 1% to 4% of the population of the adolescents, and that actually represents 10 million patients that are at risk of developing scoliosis. So that means is that there's a lot of patients that we should be checking to see if they have scoliosis or not. Now, what do we know about how well we're treating our patients in Canada? Well, a study in 2021, we found that the majority of our patients that end up in a specialized uh, clinic uh, and this is at sick kids, found that the majority of patients actually showed up too late to be seen by the specialists to have a treatment, which is braces, which is really sub uh, standard or par. And if you look at another study that looked at, at uh, um, Quebec, uh, at uh, L'Hôpital saint Justin, what they, they found is that if you did not have a primary care physician, you actually had two times higher chance of requiring surgery than a patient that was being followed by a pediatrician. So again, the idea here or the point is that if you're being followed, then you're more likelihood to being able to be caught on time and being able to benefit of a brace. Another study that looked at our so-called gold standard of monitoring, which is x-ray. So a study out of Toronto also identified that one out of four x-rays are actually misread. And that misreading actually results in a discrepancy in treatment. So again, we're missing the point of being able to identify and track our patients with the current standard of care across Canada. And what's even more uh, discouraging, that if you look back in the literature and you look at a study in 2007, you actually notice that that finding was also found is that, again, this is out of St. Justin in uh, Montreal, they found that 42% of patients being referred to specialists essentially had no deformity. And yet at the other extreme, 32% of the patient also presented too late and required surgery and again, missed this uh, ideal treatment of conservative brace. So despite so-called awareness, despite uh, training, uh, we're still doing a poor uh, means to try to manage our patients. So what can we do or how or where could we improve? Well, in a uh, system, healthcare system that uh, are struggling to keep up and that the current model is do more with less, obviously the solutions are not so easy. But ideally is that we should uh, identify or improve early dete uh, de detection or, and as well, improve access to supply specialized care. So the good thing about scoliosis is a condition that has a conservative treatment that it prevents disease burden. So ideally is by installing or reinstalling obligatory school screening during the critical growth period of children would allow us to detect these patients that are changing. The other thing is really uh, optimizing and using new technologies and change our approach and emphasizing on prevention rather than treatment after onset. And this is where sort of momentum sort of comes in. Now, just to sort of illustrate how conservative management actually could be uh, altered and prevent disease burden, We've adopted over the last few years is dual management bracing, which essentially is um, daytime and nighttime overcorrective bracing that allows us to sort of uh, not only prevent curve progression, but we're starting to see that uh, early uh, adopting of this treatment actually uh, treats patients and almost cures scoliosis. So here's a young child at the age of seven who had a almost 40 degree curve that was treated for six years in a brace, and it resulted essentially with the resolution of her scoliosis. Now, the lower child is, again, a bit younger, uh, was in a brace for eight years, and his curve went from 40, uh, 70 degrees down to 42 degrees. Now, obviously, these are uh, cases to illustrate that bracing uh, can be effective as a means to actually treat scoliosis, and that, again, we're capturing them at an earlier age than the typical uh, uh, bracing current recommendations. But all that to be said is that 
you're able to capture patients early, put them in a, a relatively conservative treatment, then there is hope uh, to prevent and change the natural history of these patients. Now, if you look at school screening in Canada, well, it was adopted in the 1970s, uh, saying that it was actually mandatory that all children uh, between uh, the age um, in grades six and seven had a nurse at school that was screening them. Essentially, this was discontinued in the 1980s and such because there was no evidence that bracing actually made a difference. Now, a lot has changed since, uh, essentially showing that bracing is effective. However, the Canadian Task Force on Prevention of Healthcare is still has not changed its recommendation. Now, if you look at school screening in the U.S., um, they also had um, uh, stopped uh, recommending uh, bracing. However, in 2018, they changed its recommendation. And they identified that early diagnosis scoliosis can allow for close monitoring of deformities and, and early initiation of break, uh, brace treatment when appropriate with a goal of preventing costly and invasive surgeries. So debate is essentially ongoing because the efficacy and the cost saving remains questionable of wide-based screening. Now, if you look at what are the current uh, screening tools that uh, healthcare professionals have, well, essentially there's three. So there's the classic sort of forward bending test, which is an ADAM test. And that uh, in this uh, review paper shows that uh, the sensitivity is about 84% and specificity is 93. Now, what that means is that the sensitivity is being able to identify a patient that has scoliosis on this test is essentially 84%. That means that there's 16% of the patients that actually have scoliosis that you miss. Now, the specificity is how often you actually are able to identify a patient uh, that uh, does not have scoliosis, and essentially uh, that is at 93%. Now, the second test, which is uh, the addition of a use of a scoliometer, which is essentially a, a level that you put on the back of the child's, uh, on the child's back, and that you see that its sensitivity has increased, uh, yet the specificity has dropped. So essentially it means that you will be picking up more uh, false positive, meaning that the test will be indicating patients that don't have scoliosis, that you think have scoliosis, and then you'll be incurring more x-rays. Now, the third uh, sort of means that has been used and again studied is this moray topography. So essentially, this is the child is standing. Uh, you project almost like a heat map um, looking at different surfaces onto the back, and then you uh, take a picture of this, and it gives you a depth map analysis. So what it does, or what this test does, is that the sensitivity is very high. It's 100%, so you will pick up um, essentially 100% of the patients. Uh, but the challenge is that you have actually a high false positive. So you're actually, again, telling patients that they have scoliosis when they don't, and therefore triggering an x-ray, which has a negative impact on their overall health. So it's almost too sensitive and not specific enough. So essentially, at the end of this study, essentially they concluded that forward bending tests or the atom test alone is inadequate for screening for students. And that, however, at the other extreme, Murray uh, was too costly and had a too high false positive results uh, that actually resulted in increased uh, imaging for the patients. Now, if you look across the world and you sort of say, well, uh, is effective school screening uh, of any value anywhere? Well, you need to turn to Hong Kong. And this is where they essentially looked at and have been looking at uh, school screening and have effectively managed to um, identify the patients at the most uh, uh, cost-effective way uh, and minimizing the risk of uh, inadequate referrals to specialists. And the way that they do is essentially they combine the three, imaging, uh, three uh, screening modalities. So they uh, combine the scoliometer, and if they actually have a high rotational value of 15 degrees in conjunction with the forward atom test, the Moray test, then they have a specificity of um, 93%, and then therefore a sensitivity of almost 100%. So that patients, so their false uh, positives are, are very low, and their false negative is also relatively low with a predictive uh, value of 81%. Essentially, what we've sort of looked at through Momentum is using a regular smartphone that we actually have digitized the human body, quantifying the clinical deformity, developing an easy screening and monitoring tool. So what we uh, have done is essentially that we're able to combine and we've developed this mobile application where the parents or healthcare providers can use this, uh, can go ahead and scan their child's spine in standing and bent position, which mimics the forward bending test, 
that generate a 3D surface topography that can be used to quantify the deformity combining all uh, in one of the three methods of screening. So these are the representation of the child with his X-ray, the full body 3D topography, and again, the uh, Moray uh, surface topography on a bed uh, position. Now, what we did is that uh, trying to uh, identify the proof of concept, we essentially used the mannequin, mimicking scoliosis deformity. We cut the mannequin in different uh, seven different areas, and then we started spinning the different uh, planes. Essentially, uh, we scan this model uh, uh, to being able to predict the correlation of the 3D uh, reconstruction topography and the degree of induced rotation. So what we found is that we had an extremely high correlation, almost 100%, that our average rotation error was, was two degrees, and that the inter-observer reliability and the intra-observer reliability was, again, extremely good. And so therefore, we felt that uh, we had a 3D surface topography that was able to identify and uh, mimic depth map, the forward bending, and the moral equivalent. Now, in addition, what we wanted to do is also to quantify the results from a volumetric approach, sort of looking at the scoliometer equivalent. And again, our results, the correlation was slightly less. Our average error was slightly higher at five degrees. But yet again, our inter-observer reliability and intra-observer reliability were excellent. So we felt that this was, um, our app was actually good enough to go ahead and do a clinical study. Now, before I give you an idea of a bit of how we did the clinical study, this is how uh, parents could acquire the 3D model. So essentially, uh, we asked the um, patient to, to, to dress appropriately, um, uh, allowing us to sort of see uh, their shoulders uh, covering the breasts and allowing us to, to see uh, as much as we can of the uh, surface area of their backs. And essentially, we then asked the, the parents to walk three times around, essentially scanning uh, the patient that gives us this 3D photorealistic uh, model. And then so the, the frames uh, of the video are extracted. We essentially realign the camera. Uh, we actually uh, crop out uh, the face so that we uh, respect the patient's privacy. The model is realigned, and then we actually model uh, the, the uh, we scale the model to appropriate height. And then essentially, uh, again, using a combination of AI uh, predictive model, we, we uh, not only look at the standing film, but also the bent uh, uh, the surface topography that allows us to differentiate left to right, and essentially calculating uh, the scoliotic, uh, scoliometer angle. Now, once we did that, uh, and then we essentially uh, compared and, and created a predictive model using the x-rays, using the atom bent surface topography, and the total body 3D surface topography, and then we uh, put all of this into a convolutional uh, neural network that actually is able to predict uh, the maximal calm angle of the spinal deformity. If you look at our results, essentially we have a great correlation of uh, 0.92, uh, and our mean average error is uh, six degrees, which is similar uh, error as one uh, is obtained on a measurement of, an ang uh, of a calm angle on x-rays. And this is where things become more and more interesting. If we look at our sensitivity and specificity uh, of a child that has less than 10 degrees, uh, then uh, we see that our sensitivity is 93% and our specificity is uh, 97%. If we bump that up uh, to 15 degrees, our sensitivity is 90% uh, and our specificity is also 90% with the area under the curve of 90, uh, 90, 0.96. And as you see that as our curve increases, uh, our sensitivity drops, but our specificity continues to be uh, at 0.89 with an area under the curve of 93. Momentum for the time being in part is because of the current uh, distribution of our results, but that uh, when the curves are greater than 40, and particularly above 50, then our sensitivity drops, but our specificity uh, actually increases. And this is, you know, well, uh, it's a uh, confusion matrix that essentially sort of correlates our x-rays to our predicted uh, scans. And we see that there is a linear uh, orientation that uh, there's still a five to 10 degree uh, mismatch between our uh, measured and predicted Cobb. As we say, that um, it's about a uh, six degree error. And that this just helps us to sort of correlate and show that our predictive values are actually extremely close to our measured x-rays. 
So in the end, so what do we do with all of this? The idea is that we create a AI a based digital health platform to remotely screen and diagnose and monitor spinal deformities uh, from any smartphone. Essentially, uh, the way that we look at this is that uh, we've allowed now to have patients that instead of coming to hospital actually are able to quantify their deformity at a distance, depending on what the scan actually sort of predicts, then we're able to personalize the patient's uh, standard of care. Uh, this will unlock uh, uh, surgeon's time to be able to see uh, more appropriate patients at an appropriate time, but it also empowers patients uh, uh, to be able to monitor their own curve much more frequently, leading to better outcome. Now, the porthole has a patient porthole, but also has a care team portal that is designed to be able to monitor the results uh, and uh, set alerts uh, for progression and optimizing patient schedule. Essentially, if the patient um, scan is not changing, then there's no need for them to come to hospital compared to if the um, uh, predictive value is actually shows the change, then we'll be able to bring them in at an earlier date to possibly initiate treatment. The app also has a uh, easy to use uh, and guides uh, to help patients to guide them through their journey. Essentially, uh, we have uh, on-screen uh, clues as to how to take a scan. Um, we have a fairly straightforward sort of uh, outcome or output uh, um, screen that allows us to, to convey to the patients where their cob is at and how things have changed over time. Um, the uh, algorithm also predicts sort of different asymmetry, looking at shoulder asymmetry, waist asymmetry. There's obviously a series of resources and content to help patients go through um, what it means to have a 12 degree curve versus a 14 degree curve. And also we have a, a physiotherapy content that again helps patients to sort of uh, figure out what type of uh, physiotherapy, depending on their curve pattern, they should be undertaking. So our goal is really to sort of see the right patient at the right time. So the way this would work is that um, patients is onboarded, um, subsequent to either a, a parent is concerned that they have scoliosis, or that the pediatrician has a possible deformity, they go ahead and scan themselves at home. Uh, the, the app provides a uh, relatively estimated uh, deformity, uh, or Cobb angle. Based on that, uh, the patient will either uh, be recommended to continue uh, scanning at home or uh, that they require uh, to come in for an x-ray to confirm the diagnosis. So obviously this has a benefit for all the stakeholders. So the benefits for the patient is that there's less radiation exposures. They can have more frequent monitoring because there's no downside of, of scanning them. Obviously we'd not recommend scanning more than once or maybe twice, every, uh, once every second month. Um, they have access to custom resources. And because the, uh, the whole concept of us being able to sort of identify and initiate uh, treatment early, there's less uh, risk of progression and therefore possibly less uh, surgery. From a provider perspective, essentially uh, hospitals will now be able to tailor the patients that are coming into the hospital. So they will be able to uh, bring in patients that have that need to be seen and keep patients uh, sort of uh, away from their uh, weight rooms or x-ray uh, clinics, uh, and therefore having a sort of more specialized uh, patient distribution. You could optimize the triage for surgical patients. And again, um, this is an added benefit from surgeons that you're able to quantify uh, the surgical outcomes and correlating them with uh, uh, health quality, uh, health related uh, quality metrics. Now for their healthcare system, um, again, the, the, the hope is that we'll be able to decrease the, the number of surgeries, we'd minimize um, the imaging costs, we'd reduce the long-term disability by in, uh, avoiding the surgeries, and that uh, we probably, or we hope that this will uh, increase the ability for primary care physicians to uh, track and monitor the patients and only refer the patients that need to be seen. So again, sort of just reemphasizing essentially what we would do with momentum is that we are able to uh, decrease the amount of radiation. So there's by using a 3D surface topography, um, the AI would augment the predictive value of the current uh, screening tools. Um, and again, incorporating an optimum screening tool in the po general population would again improve the overall um, quality of care. Having the uh, app uh, being followed remotely, there's obviously an increased monitoring and improved uh, screening programs.
So this is how we would sort of see a momentum implemented in a care pathway. So obviously this is sort of small. So we, the top row is not using uh, momentum and the bottom is, is using the app uh, throughout the care. So we'll, we'll just sort of look at this or go through this. So as I was telling you a bit earlier, either parents or there's school uh, uh, nurses or pediatrician may wonder if they have scoliosis or not. And they often send and, and have a patient go see the pediatrician. Problem with this is that uh, there's no school screening really. Um, and there's actually no more healthy uh, children visit in our pediatricians. So they, here in Quebec, they, they've stopped actually uh, funding uh, patients to be seen in the pediatrician's office uh, for a so-called healthy visit. So therefore their, their screening is actually de uh, decreasing. So depending on how uh, the pediatrician feels or not based on a Adams test and a digital exam, plus or minus the scoliometer, they may decide to send the patient for an x-ray. And what we've shown is that there's a significant error in x-ray measurement in the community. So again, so we're, we're worsening uh, or, or sort of confusing the, the picture even more. And then depending on what that angle sort of shows or not, then either they'll be referred to orthopedic surgeon. And this is what we've talked about, that there is actually quite a wait time to be seen by an orthopedic surgeon and that the actual uh, quality of the referrals um, are actually are either too late or um, are not required. And then so therefore there's a high percentage of inappropriate referral, yet there's a high late referral. And that's so really not effective in any way of looking at how we're treating our patients that have scoliosis or may have scoliosis. Or not. And then depending if you actually have scoliosis, then you fall into this trap now that you're depending on your Cobb angle. So, so depending on the severity, um, the um, specialist is going to say, well, I need to see you again in another six months. You're going to have to come back to clinic and we'll get a new x-ray. And that chews up uh, resources. Or they actually say, well, you have a scoliosis, you need a brace, and then I'll see you again in six months. And independently, if the child is growing a lot or not, there's just this uh, sort of imperative uh, decision to see them every four to six months without really sort of tailoring it to that child's growth and change over time. And the ones that have surgery, well, then you, you know, go uh, series of surgery, um, series of x-rays, you have your surgery, and then afterwards, you're still being followed to make sure everything's okay with serial x-rays. So the clinics are really overloaded. There's a, an excessive amount of x-rays and children are being radiated to monitor scoliosis that may or may not be required. The way that we sort of see momentum that could sort of help all this is that it would be a upstream type of triage tool. So depending on either the family's worried uh, or uh, the school uh, nurse sort of noted that maybe a gym or the uh, ballet instructor sees that, well, maybe the spine is not as straight. Families could sort of get access to momentum health, go ahead and screen. And then they would have this uh, metric that would sort of guide them as to, well, should I go see the pediatrician or not? And then so based on that, patients could go see the pediatrician. Pediatricians sometimes are a bit afraid or not really sure or not adequate enough. So again, Momentum could help them as a aid, a diagnostic aid, just like the Moray uh, uh, topographic uh, measure. But this is, again, all-inclusive all type of uh, imaging modality that has no radiation that they're able to sort of either better define if the patient does have a deformity or not. And then based on that, then the patient would fall into and see a specialist and then the specialist, the way that we see momentum is that we could go ahead and sort of have remote monitoring for the small curves. So essentially the patient would be seen, would have an x-ray, confirm a diagnosis, and then they would be enrolled in using momentum. And then every month they would sort of scan themselves. As long as the um, prediction is not worsening, then the patients can sort of stay at home and stay out of the clinic. And therefore only when that would be triggered, then you would come in. And again, the physicians uh, could sort of dictate, depending on the amount of change, they'd still want to see them or not. Mm -hmm. Second scenario is really the patients that are embraced in the same concept, instead of having them sort of come back at intervals that are not dependent on the patient's either status or growth. Um, what you would do now is that, again, the patients would be scanning at home and that if there is a change or that um, there seems to be a worsening, then you may want to change the type of bracing. Uh, or that the patient has outgrown the brace that needs new uh, fitting for a brace. And again, all of this would be done as a remote monitoring for patients that are braced and that the ones that would have a trigger but then would be come in and therefore um, you'd be freeing up uh, quite a bit of space for new patients coming in. 
Same thing with the surgery. The idea is that postoperatively, one could sort of uh, monitor um, how they did uh, post-op, and then you get an X-ray, quantify that amount of X-ray with the current deformity. As long as things don't change, it means that the fusion is taking and that everything is going well. If there is a change, then that would trigger an in-hospital visit. So the idea is really is to open up space for new referrals. Uh, it would sort of have a direct effect on being having less X-rays, um, and then therefore sort of personalizing the care for each patient a bit better. Again, I'm sort of hitting this home, but seeing the right patient at the right time and using the app and trying to optimize our clinic and provide the individual standard of care to really benefit the patients. So essentially at Momentum, our mission is really to empower patients and clinicians to remotely manage spinal deformities. Our vision is to really replace unnecessary repetitive x-rays with remote surface topography. So this is our team, essentially. Um, uh, Evan Diamondberg is our uh, co-founder and COO. Philip Miller, we hired him uh, as our COO. Two bright, very energetic uh, gentlemen that have brought uh, new age technology and allowing uh, an old surgeon uh, learning new tricks. And then we have Frank uh, Dritz, who's a, uh, our CTO, uh, essentially the, the brains behind uh, all the AI. Thank you so much and happy to answer any questions. Oh, terrific. It looks pretty, but very fascinating technology. And I actually um, have used this app with uh, my patients as well. So I've had firsthand experience with it. It's pretty fascinating. And I love the uh, potential of monitoring uh, patients between x-rays, you know, if they're still growing, monitoring uh, patients as even as adults to see uh, what's progressing because everyone has concerns in terms of, you know, is it getting worse? Am I, you know, especially with parents, um, am I seeing things? And it produces a lot of anxiety in, in parents. Um, but on top of that, with the Canadian healthcare system, oftentimes it takes, you know, three months to get a referral to an orthopedic surgeon. Um, bracing after that is uneven uh, across the country. Uh, I love the fact that uh, you do double bracing in, uh, in Quebec. I think that makes complete sense. Um, and I also like the fact that you can even uh, monitor without having to do x-rays in, uh, with respect to, you know, being out of brace, seeing if the brace is effective. Um, how did so we get, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say that there is so, uh, we're just sort of scratching the surface as to how we could use this, you know, and, you know, so we talked about bracing, which again, as a, you know, orthopod, you know, I, I've been sort of indoctrinated and, and the more the studies are coming out, the more you realize nighttime overcorrective bracing uh, is finally getting its recognition. Uh, often that's what I recommend when we have small curves and, and sort of initiating the patient with the idea that they have to wear a brace. The stigmata of having to wear the brace at school is, is not the initial. And if we could avoid that for, for a lot of the children, it, it's a great benefit. And that, uh, so again, so the idea of, of sort of nighttime overcorrective brace, it, it works the best when the curves are, are really caught early. And again, this, this whole idea of capturing change quickly and getting them in a brace, I think really makes a difference. The, um, as you pointed out, you know, one of the inequalities across uh, Canada is, is really the reimbursement for bracing. And that, um, so this is something that I, I've sort of, you know, started getting on my bang wagon and, and sort of um, my soapbox saying that it, it's almost inconceivable. So in Quebec, uh, both the daytime and the nighttime bracing is covered. Um, now, unfortunately, out west, um, there is no coverage. So the, the healthcare, uh, provincial healthcare is not covering. In Ontario, they do cover the daytime bracing, so the typical Boston brace, uh, but they do not cover the, the, the overcorrective brace. Um, out west, uh, again, also uh, very poor coverage. So, so the families are having to sort of adopt or the children that we're recommending bracing. Uh, some of the hardship for families that have to pay for bracing is actually have a negative impact on their overall health. So we should really be trying to sort of muster uh, support it and trying to change one, the current recommendation of school screening. And the other one is, is really trying to get the provincial governments uh, to adopt this um, preventive treatment for scoliosis rather than saying, well, we'll just sort of let's see how things pan out. And then we end up doing this expensive uh, heart um, uh, wrenching uh, surgeries on children that, that in families that have to go through all of this. 
And if there is, if they're caught early, we could probably avoid quite a few of them having to have surgery. Now, with with respect to the um, current state in Canada, um, ha, you know, with myself in Toronto, having uh, my son and having gone through the whole process of trying to navigate that, it was pretty frustrating. Um, and I understand that um, hospitals are overwhelmed. Um, again, you have um, uh, inappropriate referrals or referrals too late. Um, and with respect to pediatric parent patients, it's tough, but even for adult patients, it's very difficult as well with scoliosis. I was wondering if you can address any kind of possible solutions for waiting lists, appropriate referrals for both pediatric and adult scoliosis patients. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll tell you, so the, the challenge, as you pointed out, managing scoliosis across Canada is really in a bad state, especially recently. Uh, you know, the uh, CTV news and there's been a lot of uh, press uh, looking at uh, some of the adult surgeons that treat scoliosis have decided to stop treating it in part because the, their time or they feel that their time is not well compensated by trying to manage these patients. And when you think about it, unfortunately, an adult that has scoliosis, they actually have worse uh, health inequalities than people that have cancer, cancer. Uh, uh, cardiac disease and uh, emphysema. And, and, and that's so the burden of adults um, that live with uh, adult uh, scoliotic deformity is actually quite uh, severe. And so these patients tend to be ill, uh, are um, not very mobile, and their general health is really poor. So when you come to the point where you need to manage their spinal deformity, um, the burden on the uh, health system is huge. And if you look at the patients that have undergone uh, spine surgery there's quite, for scoliosis in the adult, there's quite a few that don't do so well. Um, and our ability to identify who will do well and who will do poorly uh, remains a bit of an enigma. And that's what we've looked at it is in some of the interesting studies coming out of uh, California. Uh, and they're looking at really uh, basic uh, physical um, reserve, if you want. So, so what they've looked at in trying to identify are markers of patients that will tolerate the surgery and that they actually will benefit from. And if you look at the surgical outcomes, they're actually their quality of life uh, improves dramatically after a surgical procedure for scoliosis. They have probably the highest complication rate, but the benefits, if they pull through, is actually significant. And that uh, they become much more active and their pain is much less. Their visit to uh, seeking health care uh, for a lot of their problems actually drops significantly. So as the treating physicians, our, our responsibility and role is really trying to make sure that our patients don't end up in a, such a poor state of health, because it's a bit of a vicious cycle, that we should be trying to capture them earlier. And again, this idea of uh, core strengthening and exercise for adult patients to have scoliosis is really key. And that the worst thing that you could do is actually start, stop being active and being flexible. And that you get this beginning spiral. And what they've found is that really it's this ability to keep your head upright or sort of on top of your hips. And so it's called this sagittal balance. And that, so again, so if you think about our you know, global alignment, which what this you know, sort of medical imaging that has little, uh, cost and little impact on the patient, so there's no radiation, we're able to help patients to maintain or make sure that their overall posture is good. And if it starts shifting, then again, being proactive and in initiating physical therapy uh, will probably help a lot of these patients staying away from, from surgical procedures. The other issue in the, the uh, uh, Canadian uh, Business Bureau uh, just came out with a report that actually shows that uh, uh, delaying uh, treatment for scoliotic patients actually has a huge burden on the healthcare. And that um, uh, they, they um, came out with a, an astronomical amount that any uh, delayed surgery, you end up uh, multiplying by millions of your overall cost per patient to try to treat these patients. Interesting because. Uh... I remember when I uh, interviewed Dr. Stuart Weinstein uh, regarding, um, you know, natural history, the Iowa study, 
uh, for um, patients who didn't have uh, access to surgery, you know, 50 years ago or 60 years ago now. And they were looking at, uh, you know, disability outcomes, that type of thing. And those patients who, who are now seniors um, wish they had the choice of having surgery or not having surgery, but they didn't have that choice. But the report kind of indicated that, um, you know, those individuals who didn't have surgery and were scoliosis in their seniors didn't have a lot of disability issues, et cetera. Um, so this is kind of interesting and it does make sense. And I see that in my practice as well that with adults with scoliosis, they seem to have multiple uh, health uh, factors that uh, are, are degenerating. Um, so is it more, more so that's the actual case right now that you're seeing with adults as opposed to being able to just uh, manage it on their own without, and stay, staying fairly healthy? Yeah, so I think that, uh, and as you know, you know, the, the, there are sort of two sort of broad categories of, of adult uh, scoliotic deformity. There, there are the children that had allosteopathic scoliosis um, that as they get older, their spine sort of degenerates and they have a sort of well-fixed, almost rigid spinal deformity. And, and that these patients, uh, it's not their main curve that causes the problem. It's really what happens below their main curves, sort of really at the lumbosacral junction where they get into trouble because that segment of the spine degenerates. And they can be treated almost like any other sort of individual that has spinal stenosis or degenerative processes across the lumbar spine. And you could almost ignore the upper part that tends to be sort of rigidly fixed. Well, there are some that unfortunately, if they didn't get their surgery when they were younger, they continue to progress, progress, progress. And these are the ones that, you know, typically this is what we say that if the a child that has a scoliosis greater than 50 degrees, they will progress one degree a year for the rest of their lives. If their curves actually reach almost hundred degrees, these are the ones that develop severe pulmonary issues. And then if you add on that, a, a patient that sort of ignored their advice and, and were smoking, well then their pulmonary reserve drops significantly. And then therefore their oxidation decreases and they, these are the patients that get into trouble because they have end organ uh, issues and that they get this compounded uh, medical conditions with this severe spinal deformities. But that's really the mi minority of the patients. And, and that's why, you know, the long-term, that's essentially why Dr. Weinstein was sort of saying that in essence, allosteopathic scoliosis on the long run does not seem to have that much impact. But it's really, again, there are small subsets. And again, if you, I'm sure you'll be seeing shortly that, you know, the typical cutoff was 50 degrees. And uh, speaking with different surgeons and that are seeing the adult patients, just like uh, Dr. Larry Lenke, he says that, you know, the patients that have 40 degree curves, they actually continue to get worse. And, you know, one of the things that um, we often forget, um, Spinal deformity has a significant um, aesthetic issue. And that's so some of the patients uh, are actually very concerned about that. And that over time, they actually see their body changing. They're really, uh, and you know, this current society being what it is, uh, a lot of them don't like that. And then the other subset of the patients that also get into trouble is that there's a component of pain. You know, so I actually published quite a bit uh, with our, our team here in Montreal about pain. Pain. Um, in patients that have allosteopathic scoliosis. You know, as you often look into a book and you sort of read, well, is AIS painful? And they often tell you no. But the reality is that if you dig into it, you actually see that 50% of the patients actually have the criteria is considered to have chronic pain. Well, kids being kids, they still go out, they continue to play and they do some of their sports, but, but there's a fair component of the sort of young adults or even the sort of older adults, is that one of the main drivers is pain and the ability to get rid of pain is associated. So if the long-term studies, the Weinstein studies, show that there is a slightly higher incidence of, of pain that is related with having a diagnosis of scoliosis. And then so living with that, um, the solution is probably not surgery at the onset. The, 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 the solution to that is, is really maximizing flexibility, maximizing hip flexibility, because that's one of the first things that sort of gives way um, that you get contractures around the hips. And because of that, you, your spine starts shifting even more. And the patients that have scoliosis don't have that sort of natural sort of balance and that they get into trouble. And you get this, into the cycle that these patients actually live with chronic pain. 
So being able and sensitive to the fact that you need to stay flexible, you need to work your core, you need to work your hips, uh, is really how I sort of look at you know that transition from an adolescent to about scoliosis to an adult that has scoliosis. Now that category is completely different than a patient that did not have scoliosis and they developed degenerative scoliosis. And so this process is very different and the presentation is also very different. So their curves are much, they tend to be smaller. Their pain is localized where the deformity is. And that's really, uh, in, you know, it's sort of an accelerated, um, or sorry, not accelerated, a uh, slowed down process where the disc and probably the facets wear out. And because they wear out, there's an increase in stability. And that increase in stability triggers this rotational deformity. And therefore, now you're actually accelerating the derotation and, uh, and the wear on some of these vertebrae. And these patients that have these sort of de novo degenerative scoliosis are much more symptomatic. And that uh, these are the ones that uh, also have severe disability fairly early in their life. And that being able to manage that um, has actually a significant benefit. So again, trying to differentiate the different sort of uh, allocytopathic scoliosis that have become older and the de novo degenerative ones sort of really dictates different management than the prioritization. And that both of them at the end of the day is really trying to maximize your core, maximize your flexibility around your hips to try to avoid some of this uh, progressive instability. I don't know if that helps a bit, but uh, at least that's how I see that. And, and again, our patients, you know, trying to navigate that and trying to see a specialist that is able to sort of reassure you, say, hey, listen, what you have is it, it may change over time. You know, um, it is a good way. You should be able to monitor it. And there's different ways of doing that. Well, uh, momentum is one of those solutions. Um, and again, the idea of having sort of sequential x-rays at the period of time is also a different way of doing that. And that, um, but being able to guide that in a current healthcare system is extremely difficult because, it, you know, in Montreal, it almost takes a year to see a spine specialist uh, as an adult patient. So, you know, there's a lot that happens within a year uh, for the elderly, and they're often sort of felt that they're left to themselves and, and that, um, you know, the, the Toronto area had actually stated their stop doing uh, adult spinal uh, surgery because they don't have the infrastructure uh, to be able to safely do their surgery and, and bring the patients back to where they should be. So um, there is hope, you know, in the sense that the Canadian healthcare system uh, is going through a transition. I, I think that um, we do need to sort of, sort of change. There's no way that just fixing that things are bad, you know, after the fact, we really start to look at, and this has been, you know, a lot of people have been advocating this, but you know, prevention it goes a much further way than, than just trying to uh, treat um, there, you know, subsequent to the, the, the disease that has progressed to the point where you can't do much other than surgery. Good. Thank you so much for uh, your presentation on uh, Momentum Health. Really fascinating. I enjoy using the app myself for my patients. It's, it's uh, really gives them quite a peace of mind and gives them uh, a sense of control as well of your destiny. Uh, so it's, it's great to hear because uh, yeah. I'll tell you, I'm, uh, we're just, you know, we just started, we have a, a Health Canada approval and we have our FDA approval mm -hmm. um, and that um, one's able, we have a website. So if uh, patients are looking, they, they just need to punch in Momentum Health. And sometimes we're sort of lower down on, on that uh, sort of Google search. But if you add scoliosis, we, we tend to pop up a bit earlier. All right. Well, I'll, I'll be happy to uh, put a link down in, in the uh, comments below. And um, yeah, uh, happy so to use the, happy to have you on board. And um, we'll, we'll have to do a follow up in a year or two to see where, um, where the app is headed. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much. Have a great day.